and NCAR. And we focus on modes of variability and climate change. And my piece of that is looking at hydrological cycle. I look a lot at things like atmospheric rivers, uh, monsoons, and extreme weather events. Um, I thought what I, I've done a lot of, I've been at NCAR for actually quite some time, and I've had a lot of different roles and hats. And so I thought I would share two examples of um, projects I've managed. One is a really broad uh, example. It's called ARTBIP, which is the Atmospheric River Tracking Method Intercomparison Project. And this is this is something that's outside of NCAR. It's actually an international group with the, uh, we have got, I'm trying to remember now, at least 60 or 70 folks that are part of this, this program. Um, it's a volunteer sort of a sort of a, 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 um, a project. And so the way you manage it is a little bit different than you would manage something that was internal and small, which is the second example. I used to um, uh, manage it, or I, I used to do a lot of paleoclimate as well. And so I, I have an example of a small project that I managed just recently actually on um, deep time paleoclimate. And uh, this was a privately funded uh, project by the Heising Simmons Foundation. And so I thought just sort of I would go through the two different ways I've approached uh, these um, these projects in hopes to help, you know, give you an idea of how to do things with firm examples. OK, so next slide. <laughs> So here, this is I, this is sort of what I just sort of talked about a little bit, the two different uh, types of projects. ArtMIP, um, yes, this is a grassroots community, a lot of different people, multi-agency uh, um, universities, NCAR, DOE, um, Scripps at uh, UC Santa Cruz, or just a whole bunch of different people, both the weather community that care about operational and weather forecasting and climate community, so very diverse. Um, and then the internal one was this deep time paleoclimate one. We had uh, four of us who are full time uh, employees that were funded under this project. And we had a lot of uh, sim computer simulations that we needed to accomplish and uh, and then deliverables to the HSF Foundation. Uh, so next, next slide. So the overarching theme here is organize with the type of project in mind. So I'm going to show you two different types of examples. There are actually a lot. That's a, there's a lot of commonality between the two different um, types of projects, but it's the where the differences happen is sort of in the details. There's like I've written like a lot of words on these slides. Um, so maybe you can like refer to them later. But um, yeah, and in the Q&A, if you have very specific questions for a particular type of broad project or small project, and maybe we can do that in the Q and A, um, but hopefully this is just sort of like an outline. Uh, the the first um, point was just you know the the organizational meeting amongst all of your people in your project is very important. Uh, you need to establish your goals, your deliverables, uh, your decision making structure, especially for this broader community. The decision making structure is very important because it's often done by committee. And we, in our MIP, we have a committee where we have, you know, you know, uh, people that lead specific parts of it, and then people are responsible for certain parts of it. But it's all voluntary, and so you have to, you know, um, the, you have to sort of understand that uh, the people that are volunteering their time, it is something that they're doing um, sort of on the side a little bit, and so you don't want to give too much to one particular person. And then you also want to establish your timeline. Um, the second really important piece is to create uh, a working space that is open access. What I mean by open access is just a really available to that you can exchange information back and forth easily. This was really super easy with the Google shared directories. I just created some directories um, and I, you know, gave them essentially world permissions. <laughs> And then, uh, you know, we I use other things like uh, web pages, and um, we used uh, for people who had limitations with Google. We actually opened up a box um, uh, account to, to to exchange information within that because box apparently is a little bit more secure. And, and I, we had some NOAA and NASA people that that needed to use box. Um, and then just things like global FTP and Globus and getting people onboard and permission. Uh, so that was so we can exchange information and data sets, which is which is one, a very important thing that ArtMIP does. So next slide. 
Um, number three, yeah, be mindful of time and stresses on group members because this was like a volunteer group. You know, you can't expect people to, you know, you can't expect to send someone an email, you know, one day and then get something, get the what you want the next day. You really need like weeks of lead time to be able to, you know, um, to give people time to put it into their schedule uh, so you can actually meet your deliverables. Um, you know, you really need to be flexible too, because, you know, sometimes, you know, stuff happens and, you know, someone misses a deadline, you can, you know, say, well, yeah, you can give this to me in a couple weeks instead of, instead of now or something like that. Um, and the one thing that I tried to do was not bombard people with emails. Like I would only do emails very periodically and I would, you know, have use like, outlines and bold letters just so people were scanning it they could actually take a look at what the very important things were um, but the limited email because if you do too much information or um, too many emails people just tune out um, and then the main the the, the final thing of uh, outline point I, I put for this one is that you really need institutional support I had uh, support from not only catalyst but I had support from DOE which is my which is my primary funder right now, and that is critical because if they aren't on board with it, you really can't commit your time to that. Um, so so you really need institutional support if you embark on a project like this. Um, and then of course you know foster good communication. Uh, there's a lot of different cultural differences, especially with international community. You really need to be mindful of of how you communicate. Um, okay, so next slide. So this is the second, a smaller type of project. Um, we had four people on this project and the primary decision maker was the, the, was the principal investigator. And um, he made, he was the one that sort of made like the, the science decisions like, okay, this is what we need and this is how I want it to go. And then it was my job to sort of make it happen. Um, so, you know, the, the, the same sort of thing, it's like you need to have the, you know, this, first meeting where you sort of outline who's responsible for what um, and get your timeline down. Um, it's easier to adjust this timeline with just four people than with like a broader group of people. Um, so for creating the workspace, it doesn't necessarily need to be shareable because it's just very small, it's an it's internal organization, it's easier to share, uh, you know, just within, you know, your institutional uh, computer systems or, you know, or web pages or whatever. But I actually still use the Google Share for this. I just had a limited, you know, I just had the the people that were involved or the people with their permission that had uh, to get into those shared directories. We use Calendar a lot, which is great. You can do that with a smaller group of people um, just to, to schedule meetings and stuff. Um, another thing that, you know, we did is like we had to worry about computer allocations, uh, where we we're going to keep stuff, where we we're going to run, where we we're going to run the simulations and how much storage we had and how much, how, how much time we had for that storage and when we had to move it, uh, things like that we had to sort of consider. Um, regular meetings is really important for a small group, uh, especially if people that um, need, uh, they're different people of different styles. So you need, first of all, you need to recognize what the style of the people that you're working with is. Is it someone that wants or needs a daily or a weekly uh, uh, check-in or someone who's better if it's for hands off. So that's the first thing you sort of have to decide. But regular meetings as a group helps with cohesion and it also helps keep your keep your on the on your timeline. And then if there's an issue, you can sort of spitball about it and just figure out how to how to solve the problem. Um, next slide. Same thing, be mindful of time and stresses for group members, even though you're being paid to do this. Um, you know, this is still, you know, this might not be the only project that they're working on. And so uh, if you need to help people try to figure out how what their what their time management, is, like how much time you, you need for a particular task is great. If you give, you know, if you can give people SMS, I think, you know, we have this amount of time to do this task. You know, can you budget it in with your other responsibilities? Um, again, early notification of timeline and de deliverables is really important. It's never good to give someone an hour or a day or two days worth notice when you have, when you need something. It's, you know, sometimes stuff happens and I get that, but it absolutely should not be a regular thing. You need to give people time to plan. Um, again, flexibility, limited emails, this is all the same. 
And then uh, finally, for the group cohesiveness, um, again, it's essential. You know, sometimes it's fun to do things that are outside of work if you if you want to, that just for like a picnic or a happy hour or something like that just to just to help with that group cohesiveness. And again, pay attention to your cultural differences. Uh, next slide. So the second overarching thing was your timeline creation needs flexibility. So when you're first building your timeline, you have to really build in problems that are that are unforeseeable that are going to extend the timeline. Uh, you know, this is harder for this was easy, easier, sort of easier for ArtMIP because we're sort of self-directed and and volunteer, so we can just keep pushing the timeline back as long as everyone agrees. But it's not so easy if you actually have a hard timeline deliverable. So when you're, you know, so you sort of need to manage, figure out what your uh, what your project is and and uh, how much flexibility you need to build in there. Um, so like there's a lot of software management tools that are actually out there that I that I totally would encourage you to engage with because you know just trying to use your notebook or even just you know <laughs> you know like a, a a Google Doc with the outline of your of what you want to do is great but the more um, stuff that happens in your project it's going to be harder to manage so there's lots of like project management tools out there that are great for different things. You know, I used, as I said, the software, the Google, just for the organizational structure in terms of folders and where to put things, calendars, Excel, Airtable is one. You have to pay for Airtable, but Airtable is a fantastic management tool. Um, and then your deliverables, you need to be, you know, your dates could be based on the workload of others. Um, and then always have a backup plan. It's always good to have a backup plan. So the, I just put on, on this slide, like, just sort of examples of what we did with for our MIP. Um, Next slide. So this is an example of a flowchart I made for my for my paleo project. We had a number of simulations that we had to do, and some of them are dependent on the other. And so this flowchart helped me try to remember what the order of operations were, <laughs> and then you know, and then it was like a couple different parts, you know. So like I, you know, this is where like where project management tools can sort of help you, like the there's different ways you can organize things with colors or with spreadsheets or with or whatever. So whatever um, project you're managing, you know, you might want to pick a tool that has the bells and whistles that you need. But this, I just, I just did this. I just made a flow chart for myself in PowerPoint, essentially, um, just to keep uh, my sanity and trying to remember all the different order of operations and what we needed for each simulation and like how the flow of how it was going. And so next slide. And this is the example of a spreadsheet I use just to keep track of, you know, the simulations when we're starting them, when we were wanted to finish them, what they cost, you know, and then and then the total length of the simulation that we needed. And so I was always adjusting this. This like I the first time I created this spreadsheet was absolutely the not the last time. I must have updated things dozens of times because you have to, as I said, build in that flexibility. Um, but keeping track of things in an organized manner will really help. Uh, with your sanity. So I think that's all I have. Yep, on to James. Awesome, thanks Christine. Um, James, if you wanna go ahead and kick things off, that'd be awesome. Yeah, thanks Aaron. And yeah, thanks for the invitation today and good good to see everyone. Yeah, I'm James Stone in M cubed. So I'm also, I'm a project scientist three. I'm section head for the lab's capacity center for climate and weather extremes. So my interest is in high impact weather in the climate system. So what causes it and how well can we predict it on seasonal to climate scale? So I'm a physical climate scientist. Um, so given this event is about grants, let me tell you where my money comes from. So about 70%, 70% of my funding comes from private industry and 20% comes from NSF, competitive NSF awards and I get 10% base for section head duties. Um, oh, I've also had some experience being a project manager on a multi-lab NCAR project, so I can also speak to that. So today I wanted to say a few comments about qualifications then I wanted to return to say a few things about project management, building on what Christine has already mentioned. 
and then I'll say a few things about budget planning. So let's start with qualifications. <clears throat> so there's a number of ways I could interpret this, but this is um, my perspective on qualifications needed to submit a successful proposal. So I think the number one qualification is intellectual curiosity. So the ability to spark compelling ideas. I think if you have a compelling idea paired with a nice conceptual diagram, then uh, that is probably 70% of the proposal done. <clears throat> um, but you also need the ability to communicate it. And so that's, I think the key thing there is understanding your audience. So where you submit your proposal really depends how you frame your cool idea. So you really need to know your audience. So for NSF, that means um, spending a lot of time talking about advances in fundamental science and a whole list of caveats we're good at that but when i propose to private industry i have to turn it on its head and talk about the possibilities that uh, would be created through this project and the outcomes and then the methods and the caveats are almost a, often an appendix so you need to know who your audience is so your cool idea it resonates with them so over to the next slide, please, Aaron. Um, <clears throat> so what's worked for me is to have a cool idea, but also an idea that I am really uniquely qualified to do the work. So here's a, a picture of a cathedral in my hometown of York. <clears throat> um, it's actually not a cathedral, but uh, that's a story for another day. So there was a fire in this cathedral in the 1980s, <clears throat> where about a third of it burnt down and there was really only like one or two stonemasons in the city qualified to rebuild and so guess what they got the uh the work so how does this translate to science um well for example if you uh develop a new capability in cesm for example or some new analysis tool for wolf hydro and you propose <coughs> uh to advance this tool then really you are uniquely qualified to do the work so it, what's <clears throat> what's worked for me is to have this cool idea and be the only one who can do it and then on the next slide you also need to make sure that what the what the solicitation is asking for is what your cool idea responds to so uh, where i have failed in the past is trying to crowbar ideas that i thought were good and that i was uniquely qualified but did not resonate with the solicitation so not only do you have to read these solicitations, but actually listen carefully and read between the lines of exactly what's being asked um, and stick to it. So that's what's worked, um, worked for me. On to the next one, Erin. Uh, so talking about qualifications, so yes, it's important to shout about your qualifications in the proposal. So an obvious way of doing that is to cite relevant papers. But if this is a new area of work for you and you don't have a already published paper, then a nice way of showing you are qualified is to include some short pilot analysis. So if there's a question in a reviewer's mind thinking, oh, well, that data is not going to fit with this software, you need to demonstrate that, yes, actually it does. So a nice short um, analysis, uh, not too much. And then also it's important to identify obstacles because uh, if you don't identify them, the review as well. <clears throat> and so if you identify them and show that you have a contingency in place, then that is a very compelling proposal that shows you've thought about it and you're qualified to complete the work no matter what comes up over, say, the three years of the project. So I would say that is an impo important way of showing you're qualified. Um, next one, please, Aaron. Okay, well, that was just some remarks about qualifications. Now I wanted to return to project management and just talk about two principles that have really helped me that I learned from the UCAR Leadership Academy. So I, I would highly recommend this Leadership Academy for anyone who's interested, and I can chat with anyone who wants to know more about it. <clears throat> but so the first principle that has helped me is that there's three vertices, I guess, for a project. There's the scope so what work are you going to do does the a finite budget 
and finite time. And if you change one of these, the others need to shift as well. So what has often happened with me, especially with the private industry funded projects, you know, as you're going along, you think of this other great idea and you think, oh, we should do this also. But if you do add something, you also need to either increase the time or increase the budget. Um, otherwise, you're going to be squeezed. Um, so that is principle number one. Don't allow a project creep without asking for more money. Um, on to the second principle. <clears throat> so for a su successful project and successful project management, <clears throat> firstly, everyone needs to agree on the direction of the project. So Christine already talked about this. Um, so if your end goal of the project is unfocused or vague, you're never going to get there because you don't know where you're going. So one way to um, agree on the end goal is to create bottom-up consensus on what the end goal is of the project. Another key attribute of a successful project is alignment. So if you have five people on your project, um, what normally happens if you have scientists on your project, they like to work on their pet projects, which are not necessarily part of your project. So they can go off on a tangent and do what they want to do. And I think <clears throat> and I've been guilty about this. So you really need the work to be aligned with everyone else. Um, one way to achieve that is to define metrics or specific objectives that are about alignment between project components. And then finally, you need commitment. <clears throat> so, you know, over a long multi year project with large teams, people may not always be committed to your project. Um, and there's a number of ways that you can encourage people to be committed. Um, you could make logical appeals. So, I could say, um, Aaron, if you we really need you to do your piece of the piece of work so Mariana can then uh, start her piece of the project. Or you could um, make cooperative appeals and talk about, uh, like Hugh, I could say how great it's going to be to finally submit our interdisciplinary project. And then something I'm less good at is making emotional appeals because <laughs> these have to be authentic. So. Um, I could say, like Kelly, I really appreciated the um, the contribution you made. Um, meeting it really uh, created alignment um, among the project components. So, but it has to be authentic. If you're not feeling it yourself, then don't do it because <laughs> it can backfire. So that was just two principles of project management I wanted to share. <clears throat> and then I was asked twenty minutes ago to say something about budget. So I just wanted to share some thoughts. <clears throat> about creating a budget. Now I'm really lucky and I'm cubed. I have really, really good um, proposal support. So my job for the budget then is therefore reduced to mapping out the tasks that are needed and matching my team member's skills to the tasks and estimating the number of hours it's going to take each team member to complete each, each task. Um, that's easier said than done. And I always fall into the trap of underestimating the amount of time taken for projects. I do this in every project. And I always say I'm not going to do it on the next one, but I always end up doing it. And then you end up being squeezed. So a good rule, rule of thumb is to estimate the hours and then at least add 50%. Um, and I've noticed other proposals that I've reviewed are much better than I am at accurately estimating people's time because I think it's not going to take that long to achieve this task, but it actually does. Um, there must be some psychology going on there. Um, so that was um, the first point about my experience with budgets. Let's see, I had some another thought about budget. Oh yes, um, I've had success with proposal of, of not maxing out my budget. I'm not sure what people, uh, other people think about this, but um, if it's a million dollar ceiling, I tend to ask for say 750,000 instead of a million dollars, but other people have had success in getting the maximum, but um, I always find it's advantageous to, 
to ask for a bit less and also if you can leverage other uh, sources of funding uh, agencies and well I know private industry like like it if they can leverage other funds that you're also working on so um yeah that was a couple of thoughts about budget but maybe there's some specific questions that I can talk around also well yeah that that's the end of my um, thoughts and look forward to the questions. So back to you, Erin, thanks. Yeah, thanks, James. Really appreciate that insight there. Um, so yeah, this is a perfect segue into our Q&A session. Um, so again, feel free to submit questions to Slido and I'll hand it over to Kelly um, to share those questions and to moderate the Q&A session. But thanks again to our speakers. Thank you, Erin. And thank you to our speakers. I'll go ahead and share my screen. <laughs> All right. Um, Is that working? Yes, yeah. we can see it. Looks good. Okay, perfect. So we have a question here. The very first one says, uh, asked, did either of you take any project management courses or did you just learn as you go? And both can jump in whenever you're ready. I well, I, I guess I'll start because I just learned on the go. <laughs> I have not had any formal formal training um, with the project management. It's just sort of hand projects been handed to me, and I've learned by trial and error, to be honest. So, um, I think James has had professional training now. <laughs> well, um, yeah, this is a great question because um, maybe two years ago I naively thought. Uh, project management there's not much involved in that you just kind of get on with it but actually uh, it doesn't happen accidentally you have to intentionally engage uh, in the process and I learned that both through this leadership academy we had specific like two days training on project management where I learned those principles and other things I shared um, but then I was also hired as a project manager even though I hadn't played that role before on this five five lab NCAR project, it was about Bangalore science. Um, and so that really opened my eyes about the need to be organized, make sure everyone knows what their task is, when it's due, and hold people accountable, and lots of other um, things to create commitment, alignment, and direction. Um, so, yeah, the, the training, usually I'm a bit cynical about these trainings, but it was actually really helpful. Interesting, two different perspectives there. Um, the next question, what should be the proportion of the pilot analysis preliminary results, including text and figures, out of the entire length of the proposal? I think I, think I mentioned that, didn't I? So let me um, say a bit more about it. Um, I would say, when you're writing the proposal, if there's any doubts in your mind about how pieces might fit together, either like in a technical way or a more qualitative way, you need to remove doubts in the reviewer's mind that it can be done. So if there's at least try to download a sample data set that it is actually accessible. Um, so I would say only do enough to remove doubt, the complete work can be done um the smaller the better i would say because you don't want to do everything because then it's done <laughs> yeah good question christine do you have anything to say about that one uh no i agree with james you know when i've reviewed proposals before with that if there's just like some sort of you know figure that convinces me um that what the you know that removes my doubt, you know, of what they're saying that actually goes a really, really long way. So I think that's great advice. Great. 
Thank you. The next question, what kind of timeline do you operate under when drafting the proposal? And how far ahead of a request for proposals do you already have the components drafted? Okay, I guess I'll start just because um, with the with the catalyst proposal, uh, the catalyst group that I work with now, where um, it's a real, it's a it's a it's a very large proposal, and we start working on it a year ahead of time, uh, and that the it's a um, yeah. So I, I you do need a very long timeline if it's a, a very big big proposal um, for smaller proposals like. For example, the HSF one with the paleo group, we probably started ahead of time on that. Um, probably wasn't quite a year, but it might have been like six months ahead of time. And then, um, you know, you start, you sort of start with your outline and you get your components and then you work on um, each, you know, segment um, as it is. But you do, the lab offices often need the proposal information. I actually I don't really know off the top of my head, but it's 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 quite some time. It's weeks or months, depending on the like the bigs of the, the the how big the proposal is on how when it needs to go to the lab office because there's a lot of administrative stuff that needs to happen. James, me, you might actually know a little bit more about that than I do. Yeah, and M cubed. Um, typically, it's about two weeks before the proposal is due to the sponsor. Um, but then if, if you are including other institutions, sometimes their deadlines are earlier, sometimes up to a month before it's due. Um, so my timelines overall are a bit shorter than yours, Christine. I normally start two months before it's due, um, just because I, I don't want it consuming <laughs> too much time. So I like to limit it. Um, yeah, so I usually start two months um and a, a good strategy is also if you have a if some cool idea comes up as part of a different project i write like a one-page summary of it and then i'm and then i'm ready to go i have like these five cool ideas that i'm ready to propose places and i've already kind of mapped out who i want to work on them so that's a good strategy especially when suddenly like from nowhere sometimes they have sudden end of year funds that are suddenly available and you have to have an idea ready to go in like three days so that can be good interesting that, uh, i'll add that so like when i'm thinking of these long timelines it's it's primarily because you have people on your staff that um you know have funding that is running out or something so you need to plan like you know you if you if you know someone's funding is running out in a year or six months you really want to start working on something to to fund them Ahead of, ahead of time so that that's also a consideration uh you know just if you have people working for you well you're responsible for their funding that's great it's interesting um you know i thought maybe like um i guess it depends on the the length of the proposal the budget but also the deadline so it's a little bit of everything there's really no straight answer to it i guess um so there's a next question here and it's uh, it's asking are there any difficulties aligning priorities with private industry funding that's another good question so the reason why i like to work with private industry is they um inspire new fundamental science questions so i learned about the climate vulnerabilities um for example, I work a lot with insurance and, for example, I might have exposure in Miami and New York, say, and so they want to know the likelihood of a, a hurricane track that passes through Miami and New York within, the, you know, within a, like a two week period. So these kind of questions I wouldn't think about myself, but then I can write a proposal like what's the physical drivers creating such a hurricane track and how likely is it in today's climate, for example. And so there's always I always find there's interesting overlaps between fundamental science advances and the information needs of private industry. Um, so it's the opposite of a difficulty. It's, um, it's actually an area where ideas are created. So. Christine? The, the only difficulties that we've had with the private industry is, is just um, getting it to work with the overhead and the whole NCAR UCAR system. So I think 
there's a lot of opportunities, at least from my experience, um, I think might be a little bit different from James's um, that it's, you know, we've had opportunity, but it hasn't worked out just with the, with the, the logistics in terms of the overhead and how much you have to, you know, uh, add into the budget um, to go through, you know, the, the UCAR process. So um, I think it's, I think it's still sort of hard to bring in um, some, some of the private funding uh, that way. I'm not sure if James, if you want to speak to that, like how, how you're able to manage that. Yeah, that's a good point, <laughs> Christine. I know that can be a challenge but with um, foundations that often ah. do not pay overheads. And so the, the, award, the awards I've had from private industry, I need to educate them in the need to pay overhead and the need to pay for my broader duties, you know, reviewing papers, reviewing proposals, mentoring or supervising NCAR staff. So they need to understand I'm not a consultant. You are paying some of my time, which is not just working on your project. So there needs to be some education on both sides. I think. Um, oh, I was going to just say one more thing about um, working with private industry. So let me tell you a story. I recently got an award uh, from a new company and this a new insurance company. And they asked about six academics for ideas, for proposals. Um, and a lot of the academics had their cool ideas that only they could do, um, but they didn't listen to the needs of the sponsor. And apparently I was the only one that asked, you know, well, what are, oh, are yeah, your vulnerabilities to high impact weather? Um, so I think that was, and I got the award. So I think the, the point being, it's important to engage in a conversation with the sponsor, whether that's private industry or NSF or DOE, to fully understand exactly what they're asking for. And that puts you at the, towards the top of the pack, yeah. Thanks for sharing that, James. Um, great, we have several more questions here. Um, so building on, convince them you are qualified does it help to be a co-pi on a proposal with a more experienced lead pi versus jumping right in as a lead i'll start <laughs> um i think places like nsf i know they do favor new pis they pay more attention to proposals that are written by early career scientists i think that's true and still true. Um, I just think, yeah, Christine, please jump in while I'm thinking. I'm, I'm not. I'm actually not sure how to answer this question because I think it really depends on the funding agency, and often it might depend on who's reviewing the proposals and what what their opinions are. Um, in the review process and the proposal is, you know, um, can be hard, right? So. Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure how to answer that question. And that's completely fine. <laughs> Thank you for, for your answers. We have a few more questions here. Um, I'm not sure how long we should go here, Mariana or Erin, but I think we have three more to go. Um, so I'll go ahead and ask the next question. So how do you frame the need for your time on proposals as self-funded scientists, especially when professors will ask for less support for the same call? I'm not sure I understand that question. Um, do we mean, how do we defend our need to how do we pay for time to work on proposals as we're self-funded is that the question i think it's along those lines but if the person wants to write in the chat what they meant or to speak out um that was me so oh. thinking about you have an nsf call you have a professor who's going to call for a quarter a month you know and ask for grad student funding because they have more base funding but if you need like three months you know, how do you validate that against people who are doing a similar thing with less than a time because they have base funding? Because I was on a project with the soft funded scientists and we wrote a grant and they had to they added extra text to be like in two months, which is 
four times the rest of all the other senior personnel, which I understand because I'm soft funded. So like, how do you walk that line of like knowing you'll be in a pool of people who may be taking zero time funded or a quarter month or maybe a month at max with needing to fund like larger percentages of your time? Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah, I haven't really thought about that before, but um, I suppose if you defend the time you're asking for by breaking down how long it's going to take to complete each task, then it's justifiable and should be viewed on a par with other um, proposals. I haven't come across that as a, a, an issue. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I have much to add other than maybe just something like, you know, you can do it in terms of percentages instead of absolute hours. <laughs> I don't know if that helps. Like, yeah, well, this is actually going to take, you know, um, because I've got all these other things I'm working on, you know, I can dedicate this amount of hours to you, but this is actually, you know, big percent of, you know, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's helpful at all. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we have three more questions. We've heard a lot about admin support when writing grants. Could you please elaborate on what specific tasks you delegate to the lab staff? Yeah, let me say how it works in, in my lab. Um, there's a um, an ENCA system called Panda proposal and I can't even remember what the acronyms stand for now. <laughs> so that, but that's where all the um, documents are put together. And yeah, I'm lucky in MQ that um, they take the lead on um, creating all the internally required documents, and then they email me a timeline of, of when all these documents are due. There's about ten of them, and I have to complete various aspects of each document um you know such as um sending in resumes uh declaring my existing awards uh conflict of interest statements there's a whole list um and then i have to write the statement of work and justify it to internal reviewers to make sure we're not inadvertently being competitive uh, against uh, university researchers, everything has to be fair and above board. So, and there's a lot of justification that needs doing, but I'm handheld throughout the process. So I just respond to requests, which is really good. I don't have to direct anything. Um, and then when I'm exhausted after doing all that, then I have to write the proposal. So <laughs> it's, it's never ending. So, um, yeah, so. A lot of the direction and thinking is done by my lab, which is great. Same for CGD. They hold our hands throughout the process and tell us when things are due. And it's all they also coordinate with like if it's a multi-agency proposal, like if you have collaborators at a university or different agency, they coordinate with the the, the points on their you know, their counterparts at those different um agencies and uh um you know exchange the information because like you know like for what cu might require is going to be different what cgd requires and so you know in terms internally and so coordinating that and then presenting a unified proposal to you know whoever's the proposal is going to um the, so the lab the lab offices and the administrators know their stuff and they're they really are your you know they're making it happen for you Wonderful. That's great to have that lab support. And so we'll just take one last question. And then with that, we'll leave uh, some time for the speakers if they have some last concluding remarks to share before we close this session. So the last question is, any thoughts about how to co-develop or manage these sections across disciplines? How about people at different levels of an organization, postdocs um, with project scientists? Okay, I'll, I'll jump in first here um, because I've, I've done a lot of um, this sort of 
collaborative work with different with different people. Um, and you know, I think everyone's approach is a little bit different, but my approach is I have a very collaborative sort of approach. So I usually try to schedule, a, you know, like a meeting, <laughs> you know, across, you know, it could be Zoom. That these days it's usually Zoom because there's different people. Um, and then, you know, it's just sort of like a, um, you know, I'm called like a spitballing session where you're just brainstorming, um, you know, the different ways that you can, uh, you know, present a unified message and, 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 you know, what each person brings to the table. I mean, the, the main thing is is having making sure everyone has a voice. You know, you as the manager can take those voices in and develop something that's more unified. And then once, you know, so you get all these different voices, you try to unify it, and then you send it back out for comment to make sure everyone felt like their opinions and what they or ideas were represented. And it's like an iterative process. And that's sort of what I do. I don't know, James, you wanna add? Yeah, I was going to um, reflect that uh, for interdisciplinary work, it, it takes a lot more time to set up the project in the first place, because you have to understand how to talk to each other and learn enough about the other disciplines to know how pieces fit together. Um, so that takes a lot of time. Um, what, and I've been successful in writing multiple proposals with the same team, maybe at the same time, or in successively, so you don't have to spin up from scratch each time. Um, Although it is important to have your proposal preparation be an inclusive process, so don't um, block uh, new opportunities. Um, and then I was, my final comment <laughs> is if there's room in the budget, it's a good idea to actually hire a project manager on your project. So if it's a large project that needs a lot of coordination and alignment, um, it's a good idea to actually budget someone to do that for you so you can take the lead as scientific PI and not necessarily also doing the project management, which if it's done well, takes a lot of time. Great, wonderful. Well, thank you to the speakers for all this informative, um, this informative session. And now with that, um, we wanna make sure you share any last remarks, anything you think that we should know as postdocs, um, soon writing proposals. I have the, the final, final thought. Um, if when you're thinking about proposing to a call or um, just thinking about ideas, if you're not excited about it at the initial stage, but you think you're gonna get funded, I would advise against doing it because the only thing worse than not getting funded is being funded to do something you no longer interested in. And I've put myself in that position and it's a real drag. So I, yeah, don't propose work you don't want to do. <laughs> It's my final thought. That, that's great advice. <laughs> I would add to that is make sure you give yourself enough time. I, you know, everyone is different. I'm definitely not a last minute person. So I like to build in a lot of time for things, which probably it, the example is like, I may, may take six months for a proposal and James takes two <laughs> or something. So, but I, you know, that's, um, yeah, just build yourself enough time and, um, build in, uh, be thoughtful about who you want to include on your team, uh, and, and so and and the cohesiveness of that team. Because if the team isn't cohesive, it's not gonna it's not gonna happen for you. Thank you, James and Christine. All right, I'll take it. Um, Aaron will take over now. Yeah, um, we'll just close by saying thank you to all the speakers, to everyone who attended today. Um, and also a plug for the next session occurring on November 17th. So right before Thanksgiving, you can marinate in these ideas while you're on break and eating turkey. Um, and that one will discuss research relevance and broader impacts. So thank you, everyone.